Cool. What's up, guys? <laughs> Welcome to the Union Fitness Podcast. This is Curtis. I'm Curtis. You're this Curtis. is Jared. And uh, we got a special one for you today, guys. So, you know, you guys have had to listen to us week in and week out. You're probably tired of hearing just us. So we brought somebody real special on today, thanks to the one and only Todd Hammer for all of his connections. But uh, we got uh, the man himself. He's like the, have you seen the Eminem commercial with when they see Santa Claus for the first time? No. And they're like, he does exist. That's like Steve Goggins. <laughs> he's here. And, uh, In the flesh. And he's going uh, to give us some, uh, some history, some life lessons today. So Steve... Why don't you just uh, kind of introduce yourself um, and, uh, you know, tell the people who you are. What's up, everybody? If you don't know who I am, I'm Steve Goggins. Old ass power lifter. <laughs> Been around for a while. I'm a old coach. Old power lifter used to, used to lift in the USPF uh, back in the APF days. Uh, from way back, uh, I was the first power lifter to squat 1,100 pounds. Uh, best total 2535. Second person total 2500. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah. I think uh, I can't think of too many more people that have been around as long as you have. You know, I've been I've been lifting almost 10 years, and you know, when you get into the sport, you hear about the guys who have lasted a long time. And you're, you're, you've always been up on top of the list. And I think one of the things that people want to know is, like, how would you do it? Not, not, only, not only how did you last so long, because let's be honest, a lot of people can do this for a long time. But to do it for a long time and be at the top, and, and I, I imagine you're still lifting. I know you had a, a hip surgery, but um, I, know, I know you're probably still lifting and – and you had some pretty big lifts even into your 40s and maybe even 50s, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, I did. But I only lift now just to stay in shape. Mm -hmm. I do cycling and everything else. And I, I'm more into the coaching thing now. I would, I mean, every now and then I get into, you know, I, I'll still squat, you know, bench and deadlift. And I do the big three. but And I do a lot of assistance work. But, you know, n not as much like I used to. Mm -hmm. But I'm not... I know I'm. I will never compete again. So that's, <laughs> that's that's gone. That's long gone. Um, I mean, if I could, if, I, at this point, I've I've pretty much used up my body as much as I can. Sure. So I need I need to try to preserve it just to try to live and live a good life. At this point. Yeah. Um, but as far as going to the fact of how I lasted so long or or, or stayed in it so long, uh, I would say. It was just a road to where, where I, when I took the sport on, I just kind of paid attention to everything, to detail. Mm -hmm. I was always detailed about form, technique, uh, training, and I would listen to my body. Well, I, I learned, I didn't, and I had to really learn from my, you know, because I didn't really, I didn't really, uh, I didn't have a coach. Mm -hmm. So I more or less took it on my own to myself to, to teach my own self how to, you know. How to, how to get strong, how to do it. Because back then, you know, it was, you pick up products in USA and you read how other people was kind of doing it. You're kind of like, okay, kind of do, do something from there. So I just kind of gathered my, you know, the way I train, got my toolbox and started, you know, as years went on, I filled it up. Uh, I started learning what worked and what didn't work. Uh, just stayed away from, uh, you know, just uh, going all out all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, you know, I, at first, I, when I, my first three, four years in the sport, I mean, I went at it like anybody else. I wanted to compete as much as possible. Right. You know, three, four, I mean, probably a couple of, probably one year, I probably competed like five times like some stupid, <laughs> you know. But, uh, so it just, you start off like that, then you learn, like, you know what, you know, you're not going to like, I knew I loved the sports, and I wanted I wanted to stay in it for a long time. Mm -hmm. so. Now, what what motivated you? Was it was it just did you just love training that much, or did you train because you knew you could be good at it, and you just wanted to be as good as you could be? 
I felt like I could be good at it once I started, you know, getting strong and it's just like uh, one lift came behind the other one. I, I mean, because I started from the very bottom. I didn't have any, any big-time lifts when I first started. I mean, so it was just a, just a work in progress, and I just wanted to be. I was One day I was watching, um, I think I told you, I was watching Wide World of Sports back then. <laughs> uh, I think it was Wide World of Sports. I think it was, uh, ABC Wide World of Sports. Yeah, they would show yeah. the commercial. And uh, those guys would come on. They'd have different athletes, you know, the agony of defeat. Dun, 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 and thrill of victory. <laughs> <laughs> it was a commercial. And I seen this one powerlifter on there. I think it was Eddie Penley. Pen, Pen, he's from my, like, uh, England or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, and he was on there, and I saw this guy had, he was just like, ah, and he was sliding, hit, you know, he was doing a power to me. You know, and they just showed him just for a brief moment. And I go, shit, I want to do that. Uh-huh. That's what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I was pretty young back then, because I would always watch, you know, bodybuilding, watching Arnold and those guys, you know, uh, watching that stuff. But I know I never, never wanted to do that. But I was, <laughs> right. but I was uh, amazed by how big they were. Mm-hmm. But then I saw power and how strong they were, and I just wanted to be strong. So I just I followed, started following that road, and just, you know, one thing led to another. Just kept on. So, I mean, if you didn't have any, you know, when I started, I didn't really have a mentor either. And um, where I grew up, there there was nobody that was powerlifting you know i was training in a ymca and it was just kind of general fitness related individuals and you know but i had fortunately elite fts to to kind of show me the way i was watching all you guys lifting videos articles everything like that so that kind of guided me but you didn't have that so i mean how did you know if what you were doing was was keeping you on the right track or, you know, how did you learn? Were, was it just you listening to yourself? Well, I had some, it was a few powerlifters around, around and once I went to a, a power, well, because I went my first powerlifting meet, I think I was like, uh, it was a YMCA powerlifting meet. I think I was probably like in the 10th, 11th grade. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, I got in that thing, it was just like, I heard about it like uh, about two months, be- you know, before it was, and uh, and I was already like, you know, squatting and, and you know, doing everything in my basement with with a, a ninety pound set. <laughs> I, right, had 90, right, right. I didn't really have a true weight set. I had a ninety pound weight set, and if any, if I wanted to make it heavier, uh, my dad would have like some uh, like car rims or nice. a brake drum yeah. or something, and I would just that's how I'd add weight. Mm-hmm. And so I started that way, and I just kind of, uh, when I got the weight set, they had a pamphlet with it on how to work out. So that's how I read that on how to, you know, you know, had, you know, about doing curls and overhead presses. Yep. So that didn't that didn't teach me. <laughs> but then um, it was just a matter of, you know, they said they had to squat, the bench press, and the deadlift in the competition. I'm like, okay, well, I need to squat. Yep. And so I just started squatting. That's what I remember. I just uh, started squatting and on my own, and just kind of like uh, working up to a, a certain weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing really, no really routine. Mm-hmm. So it was just kind of basic. Uh, then as I got past that stage of uh, high school, you know, because I was the only one in my high school that really wanted to power this, uh, the next step was kind of like, I guess when I ordered product in USA, and just seeing stuff in there, and just went step by step, and I joined the military, and it's uh, and I had a couple of training partners that trained, and and I kind of like, you know, uh, to be honest, do I? I don't really remember exactly how I set my routine way back then. Yeah, it was just yeah. kind of like, it was just kind of like a it's a workout. You just you know just go in and just like go up to a certain amount of weight and back back down and. Uh, you know, do some reps from there. I'd always do everything off a single at first. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. go up and do a heavy single and work back. And I just, I did that for like until I learned. You know, just started learning like just watching other guys and watching other people. I'd watch the other lifters and read stuff in the magazine, and then I would come up with my own routine from that. Gotcha. That's most of what I would. Yeah. So you you brought up that uh you know you had like some training partners along the way. 
did you like get a lot of benefit from training with people or did you kind of like flying solo more no you got to have training partners i mean I, I i believe in you have to i mean there wasn't even even if it's not uh, you know say people who can coach you or know more than you as long as you got good people around you even if you're helping them it's good to have a training partners so no any training partners I've ever had, man, it's been it was been a it's, they get credit for for a lot of stuff that I did because I, it, it's motivating to have them. I didn't like going solo. I don't I don't when I competed or well, when I trained, I didn't really like training by myself. Mm -hmm. I like having people around me. You like having a it's power to me is 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 much better when you have you know a group of guys to train with or even you know girl whoever to mm -hmm. train with. Uh, if you got some people that want to do the same thing you're doing and you're into it and, and y'all like on the same sheet of music and you're about helping each other, it's better that way. Yep. It's much better. Now, um, I mean, I've seen some of your, some of your like videos from, I don't know if they were from like the early 2000s, but you always had a crew with you when you were training. And I mean, they, they were hype. And that's something that you don't see a lot of today. You know, you see a lot of people that uh, like training by themselves, or maybe they do train with one or two other people, but they're not really cueing, and, and, you know, it seems like they're just there lifting. Like they're not, they're not there for each other all the way. I mean, you always had guys with you. So one of my favorite videos is like, I think it's your 900-pound deadlift uh, mm -hmm. in, in training, and everybody just comes up afterwards. Like you could hear everybody in the background mm -hmm. hyping you up before you lifted. And then uh, as soon as you put the bar down, it was like eight people came out of nowhere and just started high-fiving and everything. Yeah, that's it right there. You know what? And, and that fires me up you even talking about it because that's the way we trained. That's the way it was. That's, yeah. I mean, we, we, did, we did that for each other. They didn't just do it for me. I did it for them. Right. That's what we did. Right. Yeah. We actually, we're going to play this real quick. Josh just pulled it up. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, videos ever. Yeah, my training partner on there was Kevin Thomas, KC. Okay. He's the man. He's, he's the one doing. He's, he's the one can get gave me the high five. He'd always be behind me, you see him. Yeah. You know, and everything. Now, it, is this is this down in Georgia or is this is this still in Virginia? You grew up in Virginia, right? I grew up in Virginia, but I never really uh, never really trained in Virginia except when I was younger. I only trained there for a short time. Gotcha. I, this is I was in Georgia. That's when I came. I went to Texas and trained there for a long time, and came back to Georgia. Came to Georgia. Look at that. God dang. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love See, that. See, that's the best part right there, man. That's what it's all yeah. about. It's kind of funny yeah. you brought that video up. Yeah. That was my hype video. So. Steve, I actually did. It was like t 2015. You hosted a meet in Atlanta, and I did that meet. That was my hype video going into the meet. <laughs> I'm not going to lie oh, to you. Wow. Yeah, I actually bombed out of that meet. And <laughs> after the deadlift, I pulled something, and, and you came up to me. You're like, hey, that was a good pull, kid. And that was it. <laughs> so I did oh, meet man. you once before. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, but those. I mean, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. I got, I got, uh, like, I got lip as I train now from guys. I mean, I hope they hear this conversation because. I'm always telling them, I'm like, you gotta like, man, y'all like hype each other up, like, you know, you go on, you know, help him, you know, like, get in his head, help, you know, help, mm -hmm. help him get ready, you know, don't just, don't just like stand there and watch. I'm coaching, but hey, you guys train together, so you know, get hype. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, that's the most irritating thing to me to see people train together and not really help get each other, especially when you're going for your, you're getting close to the competition, you're going for your big lifts, your big. Uh, your numbers where you need to hit triples or whatever you need to do. You just want your training partners, you want to hear them. Let, let them know you're there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any motivation and thing you can hear, it makes a difference. And it, that drives, that's, that's the, I, I hate, I can't stand to be in a room with people not motivating each other. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. I love it. I think, uh, I think one thing that you're beginning to see a lot, and I have a couple of theories about this. I don't know if they're true, but um, with social media now, when when you see somebody post a video and they hit a big lift, it's you just see them, right? And they got their headphones in, and you know they're in the corner of the gym, and they may not have anybody with them. So, you know, maybe people see, uh, hey, that dude's training by himself. 
I'm just going to train by myself. I don't need any training partners. And right. what you're, you're seeing like a divide right now in not just powerlifting, but, but training, working out, whatever, where a lot of people, I think, just want to be uh, alone. And I think there's, there's some benefit to that sometimes, right? Because sometimes you need your space. You, you know, you gotta, you gotta do it just for you, be involved with yourself. But I mean, what, what's like your advice for somebody who legitimately says that they're trying to be good and they want to be the best that they can, but they don't like training with other people? Man, that's, um, that's a, that's a tough one because, you know, I've seen some guys that train by themselves and they do real well. And to me, if you can do that well training by yourself, you can do that much better if you have some good people around you yep. and good help. I think, I think, you know, at least five, you'll get five, you'll get a, you may get one, two, two percent more, three percent, you know what I'm saying? You mm-hmm. go get a certain percentage more if you got some good help and good people around you helping. You. I mean, it just it just it just is. It mm-hmm. just gonna happen. So my advice to them would be like, hey, you know what? You need to you need to. I mean, I guess they don't trust people, but or just don't like people. You know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> to that degree, so it's really hard to really say what to tell them other than, hey, you know what? Uh, when you go to a competition, you go have people all around you. So if you can, yeah. if you are training to compete. You go have you have three judges around you. You got spotters around you. A lot of times the spotters be like, "Come on, man, let's go. You got this. Let's go." You know, people gonna be telling you that anyway. So, and you do get and you do get a. It probably hypes them up a little bit to me. I would hope. Uh, <laughs> I forgot the guy's name that used to train by himself. A couple, couple of uh, big time guys. See, a couple of USAPL guys did that. Mm-hmm. Uh, two seventy five, two sixty eight. I think his name. I know. Uh, uh, Blaine Sumner is a dude out in, he's like out in Colorado Montana, or something. Montana, I don't even know, yeah. yeah. He's a... Yeah, Blaine, yeah, Blaine's crazy as hell. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's on a different spectrum, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. that's just, I don't understand his uh, his thought uh, behind it. And I don't know, I mean, because he's, he's almost gotten hurt. Yeah. <laughs> a couple times. Yeah, no doubt. He's like, at, yeah, because he's at like a thousand pounds. He squats over a thousand pounds and he'll set it down on those things. Now, yeah. with uh, I know you uh, you coach a lot of people, both in person and kind of online, right? Right. Now, do you have you ever had uh, an instance when you're watching a video of one of your clients train, and maybe one of their training partners is doing something that you don't agree with, or you know, have has anybody ever said, "Yeah, well, I was going to do what you had programmed, but my training partner told me to do something different." Now, in that case, training partners probably not being as beneficial as what we're talking about right here. Have you witnessed that? Oh, I've had that over the years. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. They don't really never. They never really send me the video of it, or or they'll like. Or I don't know. If, I'm trying to think of how to, how to how to put it. Because I've had that in, in instances. People tell me stuff. You know what? I just I kind of stepped off the program a little bit. I'm like. Why are you going off the program? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So what, what? What? What's going on? What's What's the point? I mean, yeah. so I, I I try not. I don't. I, I don't really tolerate that. So because I mean, if, unless somebody like they're off season or something. But if you're training for a meet and you go off program, and I'm trying to like program somebody to to peak for a meet, and I get mad. Mm-hmm. That, that irritates me. Mm-hmm. That really irritates me. But I've had I've had it uh, for people that they listen to other people, and that's pretty irritating. I've I've like uh, I probably cursed them out. I don't exactly remember, but I, <laughs> yeah. I, I wasn't nice at the way I came across. Yeah. Because uh, if if you're paying me, if you're paying a coach, and you're listening to your training partner doing what they say, I mean, why are you paying me? Then? Yeah, yeah. What's the I point of having you? you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, cause I've I fired I fired a guy one time who trained with me yeah. because he he was telling me of something else he wanted to do. I go, oh, well, sound like you got it, then, man. Don't you <laughs> I love uh, it. You you yeah, know that I mean, that brings up uh, a good point. I was talking to uh, Casey Williams recently. 
you know, Casey, uh, I, I moved up here basically to train and work with him. Um, I, I love him. Yeah, love good dude. Yeah, he's he speaks very highly of you. And so does, uh, you know, Yessie. Yessie speaks very highly of you. And uh, and Doug, you know, Doug up in yep. uh, up in Ohio. So yeah. they, they all oh, yeah. said basically the same thing, that you're willing to take the time and help anybody, but you – you kind of you demand that that respect and for them to listen to the right. things that you're saying and um right you know i i feel like sometimes that's something that that people don't really do you know when it when it comes to lifting when it comes to to life whatever um and i just thought that was really cool for for them to speak that highly of you but still you know show that that you stand for something and um i think that's cool Oh, yeah, each one of them know. They, I've, I've coached each one of them, so all of them, they know. They know exactly. Because I've had individual conversations with each one of them and, and thought, you know, look, this is, this, is what, this is what I'm trying to get through to you, you yeah. know. So then once somebody understands what you're trying to get through to them, and, you know, it, it's a reason why you have, you believe in something. Mm -hmm. But you have to try to, you have to get the, the person to understand and believe in what you're teaching. That's the biggest thing. If somebody's working with somebody and they don't believe in them, they don't believe in what they're trying to they're teaching, then it's not going to work. And you're better off just saying, you know what, I made a mistake. It's not what I, what I want. It's, yeah. Everybody's it's not no harm, no foul, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think uh, powerlifting and training in general just has ability to teach people a lot of lessons. And, I mean, with yep. you being being involved in training and powerlifting for 40 years, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned or that the sport has taught you? Biggest lesson. That's a good one. Get me that one. Um, biggest lesson. Um, off the top of my head. I mean, just to, number one, uh, to respect each other, to mm -hmm. have respect for the other powerlifters, even though if you're competing against them or whatever the case may be, you got to respect everybody, and. All records are meant to be broken. Uh, next. Um, there's always somebody stronger than you somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be somebody stronger. There's always going to be somebody bigger. There's always going to be somebody better. So no matter what you do, there's always, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you, you, you can be it's whatever you want to be. Um, Respect the sport. Res res number one, respect the sport and respect the uh, uh, the background of the sport, the history of the sport. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of providers don't, a lot of young providers don't respect the sport. Uh, those are the things that come to the top of my mind. I'm not really probably, that's probably something I'm going to think about later on. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no that's cool. I, I mean, I think, like, you talk about the history of the sport, and that was something when I started lifting, it was still when guys were lifting multiply. Like when I first started lifting, like raw wasn't really a thing yet. So, you know, I kind of got brought into the sport with like the old school roots, which mm -hmm. I, I'm glad that I did because even in the 10 years that I've been doing it, I've seen the sport change a lot. And right. I think that the sport nowadays could use a little bit more of those, those, you know, old school, um, that old school mindset, but I mean, in 40 years, you've seen it change and like practically come back, you know, and then change again. So, right. you know, what are some, some of the major changes that you've seen over the last 40 years since you did it? You know, the days where you could come out with a machine gun shooting blanks before a deadlift, uh, to nowadays. I'm going to think that thing then. Um, uh... I mean, you know, with the change of raw to gear, I mean, gear was so, I mean, well, I like gear when gear wasn't, when, when before it got to multiply, mm -hmm. before, it got to that, before it got to that point. And I liked it right, right at the edge before it got to multiply. And multiply was cool. There's nothing wrong with it. So you said the biggest changes, right? So Yeah, good and bad. Yeah. Good and bad. Well... The sport going totally raw 
and not having not having gear, I think for people who don't know any don't know any different, they go think, uh, why is that bad? I think that's totally bad. I think that was a bad thing. I think I think it would have been good if we kept gear in the sport, a lesser degree of gear, not to multiply. I think mm-hmm. multiply. Multiply actually ruined the gear sport, and and the reason it ruined the gear sport is because you had the people who made the gear, who put out just whatever, just to make money, and they would just put together whatever they could to make money. They would make whatever you wanted to wear. And okay, you want okay, what make what make you want with it? like super thick. Double, you know what I'm saying? It'll make it stand up on its own. You know what you want? Well, you get, yeah, that'll be four hundred and sixty dollars. Yeah. You know what I mean? Versus when I started, the suits were like thirty-five dollars, thirty mm-hmm. bucks, forty bucks. You buy a suit for that. So the change to that, and then that went to a point to where people got turned off and like, what are y'all doing? Really? So that to me is the big. That was the biggest change in the sport. It's like. I thought that it didn't ruin his work because Raw Lipton is, is awesome. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's awesome. But I don't I don't think it's any more awesome than what... It's awesome now because... And here's another thing, too. I think there would still be more people in the sport, still be a lot of people, probably not as many with Raw, because anybody will do Raw. Because mm-hmm. everybody, nobody nobody wants to put on a suit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll tell guys now, like, hey, you guys want to try gear? They go, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I mean, that was like, and, and that was the like requirement of it. When I got into it, I was like, oh, cool. I got to put that gear. I got to yeah. learn how to wear a suit. Okay, cool. I'm all right. I'm down. Yeah. Do you sure. think Do you think there's any benefits of wearing gear, like at training as a raw lifter, like having trained with gear or whatever? Like, do you, is there carryover? Well, there's definitely carryover. Uh, is it, you mean as far as? Like, would you like, take one of your raw lifters and have them train in gear in some form to help them out in some way for, a, like, a raw competition? I would, but they're not, they not up for it. They just, <laughs> they're too, you know, they just don't. It would be too much getting in their head to get through to it, so it's not worth it. So, do, do, you think, do you think that's, like, a, a, a southern thing, like, down there in Georgia? Because, like, you know, you come up here to – Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, places up here, yeah. p- people are they down, you know, right? Down for it, yeah. yeah. I think it is a southern thing. I think it is, and then all these raw, all these raw, it's more just people just raw here to just like, that's all they want to do is just raw. Yeah. You know, that's all they, that's it. I mean, it's, gear is not even thought of. It's not it's like, ain't even a second thought. It's like not even a third thought. <laughs> it's, not even, it's, not, it's not a thought. Right. You know, it's like, up there, y'all, it, it's a thought for y'all. Yeah. So, so what would the benefits of uh, training in gear for a raw lifter be? I think it would be. I think it would make a big, big difference if you uh, if you did it the right way. Lose, breathe, uh, keep your hips, save your hips a lot of times. Um, you could overload bench presses sometimes. You know, with like sling, sling shots and or single ply shirts like the like the. Uh, the some of those you can kind of like overload at the top. Um, I think it would. I think it would make a difference as far as stuff like that. Uh, nothing. It wouldn't help really in the deadlift. I don't think. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't think it'd make much help in the deadlift. Mm-hmm. But I think it. I mean, help you in the deadlift. But I don't think you'd get carry over to where you would. You would have some of that strength left. Oh, I don't think. Sure. But I think. I think in the squat, I think it would. Yeah. Now, now speaking of deadlift. I mean, you have some of the biggest deadlifts of all time, um, done conventional. And one thing that I really think is cool, that makes a lot of sense, that still to this day I've never even tried, is turning the, hip, turning the belt around backwards to help keep you in a better position. I think you were like the first and only person I ever saw do that. How, you know, what, what did, uh, you know, what kind of training did you do for your deadlift? Like, did you... Were you more of like a heavy singles kind of guy, or were you more of a of a overall you know volume, you know getting uh, a lot of reps in? How did you build your deadlift to what it was? Well, I did them both. I did I did both, but but I tried doing you know the heavy singles. I did that for a little bit while, 
starting out. But then once I started doing the heavy sets of fives, I was always doing the heavy sets of fives. I thought doing heavy sets of fives and then following up that with rack pulls was my biggest. That was rack, and the rack pulls was my favorite assistance exercise. Mm-hmm. Just slightly above the knee. Mm-hmm. Those of me done the right way, you know, the way you do pin, the way you do them, work great. And they just, they carry over for that to my deadlift, my up. When I got to my knees, the bar would never slow. It would, it would be easy to pull it once mm-hmm. I got to my knees. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that was the biggest uh, assistance, my favorite assistance exercise I did. So. Now, would you program those like, you said, you know. Uh, anywhere probably I'm guessing like one to one to three heavy sets of five and then you would go right to rack pulls and would they be would they be heavy or you know he- heavy singles or you know you hitting them for doubles and triples doubles and triples if I did like a like if I, say a week go in and do a heavy set of five on the up floor on their lift because most of them I just do one I would always go up and do one heavy set mm-hmm. I mean whether it be if it was 700, 700 for five. 800, 800 for five. Whatever I did for five or reps I would do, I did one heavy set, and I saved the rest, and I go over and do rack. I would warm up a little bit, like start maybe at 600, 700, 800. And I always go 100 pounds over whatever I did off the floor. Okay. And I would do two to three reps, probably a couple of sets heavy, back down. I, would, I mean, I did, didn't do heavy shrugs. Uh Stiff leg deadlifts, mm-hmm. that type of stuff. Did you did you always do, you know? Did you always use your bare hands for a lot of your deadlift work, or did you use straps much to preserve? Oh, to, okay, I know I you've straps. talked about that in in uh, articles that I've read. Is that you would use your hook when you needed it for, mm-hmm. you know, for when you're getting close to a meet or competition purposes, but if it was if the technique was right, it's not something you need to train. So you would basically just preserve your grip with straps on a lot of your other work, correct? Right. And that's something I had to learn. That was a learning experience for me. And what I had to learn was um, when I first started pulling, I mean, I wasn't a big guy. I didn't have real, my hands weren't really that, that big. So I had problems with grip problems with like, I mean, I didn't start having problems with grip problems when I got to like, to like 830, 840, you know. <laughs> And I was like a 220, in between 220 and 242, mm-hmm. weight class. And so that was my grip issue in there. And then, I, but I kept using strap. But I think it was a catch-22. I wanted to get stronger, and straps helped me get a lot stronger, strengthen my back. And my squat got stronger from my, from my using uh, straps in the deadlift, believe it or not, from doing heavy rack pulls, heavy pulls out the floor. I wouldn't have been able to, like, I hold on to all that. My hands would have been just like destroyed. Yeah. As, I mean, it would have been it would have been still been strong if they were, but to not have used straps, the weight I handled in training a lot, I just, it just wouldn't have been possible. Sure. And because I didn't start out with the hook grip, I had mixed grip, so I had problems for a while. And then I met uh, Travis Mash, uh, and that was like in that was a long time after that. My you know, my dad probably wasn't even as, as at his best point at that point. Mm-hmm. But I met him, and he was doing a hook grip, and I asked him, how, you know, how to do it. And when I learned that, it just went with everything I did. It just, it, if I'd have learned that early on, and that matched with what I did early on, I would have had a 900 plus on the book. I mean, way. Yeah. I mean, it would have been, yeah, it would have been there. Yeah. You know? Now, do you think everybody, every serious deadlifter should hook grip? Or do you think it depends? It depends on your bill, your hands. If you, I mean, if you try, if if you pull in more weight, depend on your body weight and your grip. I mean, depending on how you, how, what your grip is. I mean, I think it's a plus. I really do. Mm-hmm. If you, if you got, if you got fingers long enough to hook grip, and you are using the right bar to hook grip, I think it's a plus. Mm-hmm. I think it's hard, you know, for to using that bar to use in the USAP. Yeah, I don't know if how you hook grip. You gotta be a Long hands, the grip. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah. But if you're doing a dead, dead, doing a deadlift bar, if you hook grip, that's a plus. 
Yeah. Man, it's gonna be. Yeah, it, it makes it so much better on your back, your lats. I mean, everything. The way you set up, the way your body is, it just, it just does. And you can train straps. If you train straps, you can train so much heavier. You don't right. have to worry about your grip then. You know, it just a, it's a plus. Yeah, I think you know Jared and I both uh, pull hook grip. Um, he's deadlifted over 600 at he's like a, 140 pounds soaking wet. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, That's a big deadlift. Thanks, man. Um, I've pulled. Uh, <laughs> I'm so happy that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. I, I've pulled oh. over over 800 uh, at 242, and yep. um, the reason I started hook gripping was because I was having some issues um, with my pec and my bicep right here, and I noticed that the bar was windmilling a little bit when I was going right. switch grip. So I didn't have anybody to show me how to hook grip i just kind of you know every training day i would just grab the bar a little bit different and see what felt better and once i got used to the pain i've never dropped a deadlift you know um, yeah. no i'm not pulling 900 pounds yet but yet you know right. uh, up until this point i've never had a grip issue um what would you say for somebody who is trying to or just starting out with hook grip are there any kind of technique cues or any advice you have for something like that I, I tell them to keep the um, – don't try to do heavy reps with it. Mm -hmm. I always tell people that. Don't do the heavy reps. Just do warm up with it and then do singles uh, with it, it, it on the heavy end. Do singles with it. I mean, if you want to do two reps, that's fine. But when you start getting into doing multiple reps with hook reps during training, you go, your thumbs will get just raw and you go, get just, you go eat them up. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what experience I've seen. If you're tough enough to do that and you don't have no problem with it, more power to you. Right. But I would say stick with the, stick with less reps doing it. Yep. Then when you get to your top set, and if hook grips your thing, throw your straps on, <laughs> knock it out, do your right. set. You know, right. some good set of five. I wouldn't do, say if you, say if you, say if you worked up to where you were doing a heavy set of five with, I don't know, uh, 750 or something, say if you got to work up where you could get that. I mean, I would throw my straps on. There's no mm -hmm. reason to be the use of a hook grip like that. Right. I mean, you go, you probably go, your thumbs go, you go do something eventually in there. You go, you go to hurt something. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Now, is there, is there a right and wrong way to hook grip for people who have never done it? Like, how would you tell them to, that they want to set that thumb? I set mine all the way in. I like to get, I, I want my thumb all the way underneath the bar. I mean, and get my fingers as tight as I can on it. Mm -hmm. And then when I when I when you pull against the bar and it pulls, it's go it's go move to where it needs to be, or it's go. You know what I'm saying? Right. Based on your grip. Uh, if you, I mean, I've never dropped a hook grip, yeah. so I don't, I don't know if there's a wrong. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you try to grab it, not grab it like like loosely and have some some, some space in there. I've seen like a couple of guys try to do that, and they, not, and I see the bar starts rolling out of their hand a little bit. Mm -hmm. I tell them get, get up under there, get get in there, and get your hand pull up, pull up on the bar and pull up straight, mm -hmm. where your arm everything goes straight when you pull up. You don't want to be having bent or cocked, mm -hmm. to where when you start to pull it in, it moves, you know, straightens out. So, I mean, is that the way you guys do it? Yeah, 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 I, yeah definitely. I like hook the pad of my thumb around it, and yeah, like you said, it kind of like finds that little pocket where it just sits. Yep, as much as as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, that's exactly how I said it. I'll I'll get in there deep, and then what I do is I lay my thumb so my thumb's running parallel with the bar, mm -hmm. and then squeeze it and kind of twist and then pull the slack out of the bar. And once right. once I feel that slack pull out of the bar, and that bar sets right where it should be, I know that that there ain't nothing that's pulling that bar out of my hands. Right. Yep. yep. I, I literally do pretty much the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, so, awesome. yeah. yeah. So another question we got is I know that um, just following you on Instagram um, on your Goggins Force page, uh, you you have a lot of women that you coach, a lot of females that you coach, um, and I think that's that's something that's really cool. We have a lot of awesome female lifters here as well, and a lot of really strong ones, and they've been doing it for a long time. Did they, I guess I have two questions, did they kind of find you or did you, you know, d is it a reputation that you've built down there? And how do you go about maybe training them that might be a little different than when you work with uh, men? 
They pretty much found me. They pretty much found me. They reached out to me. I don't. I mean, the last few years of my coaching career, I just like, hey, you know what? If somebody wants help, they want me. They want to hire me as a coach. That's cool. That's great. You know, I'm not like trying to like go out here and just like this time. Like, hey, train with me, train with me, train with me. If somebody wants to to learn and they want to, you know, choose me as a coach, then they they'll get me. Uh, as far as was that second question now? Was that question? Um, yeah, how, how do you go about approaching uh, coaching them um, that's a little bit different than probably how you would coach men? Um, the only difference probably is like the bench press. They do more reps than the bench. Okay. They have, they do, have to do more reps on the bench. Um, other than that, I'm trying to think. We do – because I have – we have like three bench days for mm-hmm. women. Women need to bench more. Okay. I figure yeah. out the women, when they bench more, they do it's more volume, more work. They do a whole lot better. And the same thing with the other lifts. They can do they can do more they can do more sets and reps. They can do even on squats and deadlifts. Mm-hmm. They just their endurance is better. Mm-hmm. Um, so they they're not as hard headed either. No, they're not as hard headed. <laughs> they, they will. And they will and they listen. Uh, they're they're ninety percent of my more coachable than guys. Uh, That's fair. I mean, it just yeah. it it just it just it's just so much pleasure to work with when somebody's gonna do what you tell them to do, and they're like, "Hey, cool. What are you gonna me to do? Cool." You know, and I and most my dudes to train me now. They they that way. They'll they'll just do whatever I say. Yeah. Sometimes every now and then they'll like you know, you know, hey man, so, so are we doing this? I, I go, no, I didn't say we, no. <laughs> yeah, I said we were doing it. Don't. Don't put words in my mouth. No, I'm, I'll tell you when I'm going to go do something. Don't ask me something with a suggestion of what we're doing. Yeah. You know, I know what that means. But yeah. the women, they, don't, they, they just listen. Like, hey, what's next? What you yeah. Want? What you want? Yeah. So when you're coaching whatever. people uh, and you get like a, a new client or even someone who's been lifting for a while, uh, what's the biggest mistake that you see like when someone squats? Biggest mistake is Man, I've seen a lot of mistakes. <laughs> you can name a couple. You can name yeah, a couple. Yeah, yeah. You don't stick to one. <laughs> um, head position. I, I I teach I teach differently than than probably the norm most people teach. I got a different way I teach, so it may even be different in some way you guys teach. Sure. Which is no whatever. It could. It's not necessarily. I don't like when people arch a lot. When people mm-hmm. squat down, and they're like pushing their head back. Mm-hmm. And they're bending their body back towards you know, like mm-hmm. going, the further they go down, the more they're arching and pushing their head back. I like them to keep their head neutral. So mm-hmm. the biggest mistake I see is pushing their head back. Um, heels coming off the floor. Um, knees going forward. It's a basic one. This is basic, probably the most basic thing. Knees going forward. Uh, not breaking at the hips and knees at the same time. Mm-hmm. The bar position on their back uh, may not be may not be correct. Uh, just you know stuff like that, just basic stuff. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It just and, it, and it's usually I gotta I gotta see it with my eyes. And once I see something, I see it over and over. Sometimes it takes me a, a couple of weeks to to get out all the kinks to make you know to get everything exactly the way I want it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, definitely. Because the person, the person will come back and they'll just bad habits will just they'll just keep it. Like, look, you gotta remember this every time. You know, if I try to teach them, is look when you warm it up, and you start with the bar, work on technique every the whole time. Technique, mm-hmm. technique. Don't wait till you get to your heavy set to work on technique. So that's a bit one of the biggest mistakes I see. People work on people wait till they get on the heavy set to fix their technique. Sure, um, sure. You should be doing that on the light weights, right? Yeah. Like every set, right. you should be perfecting your technique. So when you get heavy, it's already there. Well, I think right. I think a lot of people, you know, squat in particular, they'll they'll get under the bar, and in their mind they're like, it's 45 pounds. I'm just going to squat up and down, warm my legs up, right? But that's missed practice on quality repetitions. And one of the biggest things that I that I teach is uh, building hip tension. Um, so you know we want to we want to uh, externally rotate at the hips, build that tension, and then use our lats to kind of set that bar in place. And even though it's just 45 pounds, it can teach us a lot. Because if we can build that tension, 
with 45 pounds, which you know, it's hard to be, it's hard to feel tight when you just are squatting with like 45 pounds or 135 or 225. Um, it, it sometimes it really takes that little bit of weight being on your back to help everything really feel like it's it's firing, you know, on all cylinders. So um, if you can really take those first couple light sets and treat them like they're going to be your heavy sets, I think that's a big thing right there that's missed out on. It's funny you said it about the hips, but that's that's one of the things I do teach too, keeping your hips tight. As far as and, and the point of keeping your hips tight, meaning the first mistake I'll see they do is when they're standing up, when they're standing up with the bar on their back, they're not flexing their glutes, they're not mm -hmm. flexing their hips, they're mm -hmm. not they're not tight at that beginning. I teach to I teach probably the same thing you do. Teach to have your hips like squeeze your butt in, squeeze mm -hmm. flex your hips tight. Otherwise, I should see your hips kind of like go inward. Mm -hmm. You know when you while you're standing there, the whole time you're standing at the bar, you should be your hips should be your butt should be uh, in flex position. Mm -hmm. You know, but then when you get ready to squat, you should still it's going to be tight because if you're in a flex position, if you're tight when you're standing there, to me you go you go squat a little bit deeper because if you're like slightly your hips are out, then you're slightly not you're not bent maybe, but you're not uh, your butt sticking out. And you lose like a half an inch or an inch of depth. Mm -hmm. I always, and that's what I've seen. When people are standing tight at the top to get the hips in, they'll go an inch deeper at the bottom. Yeah, yeah I mean, they're just going to be more ready to like accept the load as they start to descend the squat. If your b body's not ready to accept the load, you're not going to hit depth. You're going to probably shoot forward. <laughs> it's going to be ugly. You said it the best way. Exactly. You're ready to accept it. Exactly. That's true. Now, speaking of the squat, uh, you know, you're known for your unique squat technique and squat form. Now, you know, with most people, we see that as they're going down into the squat, if the hips are going back too much, it gets harder for them to, to reach depth. How did you get to the point where you were like, you know what, this is my form, this is how I'm built, this is how I'm going to squat, and I'm going to make it work? Because I think a lot of people could be, including maybe myself, maybe even all of us be a little over critical of our squat technique to the point where it limits our progress how did you when did you get to that point where you were like this is just what it's going to be and i'm going to make it happen oh that was the number one thing about my my whole powerlifting career my, my whole powerlifting career was my squat technique i would just catch so much hell because i didn't squat like everybody else i didn't mm -hmm. you know because i've been over it you know and so People would say you need to like stay more upright. You need to like stay upright. You need to like keep your, you know, your uh, your chest up. Raise your chest up. And I tried all that. I'm like, <laughs> that just don't that don't work for me. That that's not my strong point. It doesn't keep me because my strong my back wanted to it wanted to bend when I squat. So I right. just needed to like put my hips in the right position to go deeper. Now we're deeper watching up. we're watching your uh, 1102 right now. Oh, and, awesome. uh, okay. Yeah, so we're watching it so so everybody can see it. And yeah, so you're yeah you're forward at the waist, which is you know very different. Um, right. Which a lot of people would say that that's wrong, but but I mean you yeah. have, you clearly have like super strong hips. Like the when you the more forward you are in a squat, the the harder your glutes have to work to come up out of the hole, right? So right. clearly exactly. you just like you you train the hell out of your hips, like. Well, then it's the way I'm the way I'm built too. I think my torso is a little bit longer, so it was harder for me to stay upright like anybody, like the normal person, like anybody just can do. I just couldn't do it. So whenever I started to squat, the first thing would happen is I, my, you know, bend bend over. I bend, and my hips would still go go down too. But I, at first, I had to learn because people would think, well, you're not going deep enough. And I had to learn that, well, I'm not going deep enough because I'm not going deep enough. They said, you're not going deep enough because you're bending over. And I had to think about it. No, I'm not going deep enough because I ain't going deep enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just need to go deeper with my, the way I, the way I bend over. Yeah. yeah. And once, I, once I learned that and stopped listening to them, that I would tell me that I wasn't going deep enough because I was bending over, that wasn't the case. I was just like a guy who squats upright, just wasn't going deep enough. Yeah. So I had to start going deeper, and when I started learning it, and I like, then I started like, oh, you know, this is my technique, and I start, and I, I embraced it. When I embraced it, my back got some, you know, just was just like super, got super strong. Mm -hmm. So anything I did for deadlifts, help my squats, 
and I did for squats help my deadlift, and vice versa. So for me, to be able to squat and deadlift was like, wow, they're both helping each other. Right. I mean, it's like right. it was like uh, it was fun. It was like a big just both of them just really helped each other the way I squatted. Yeah. So I, I embraced my squat style, and I, I everybody's depending on how your body is built. I mean, I try to teach people people to squat in a some that way because you want to I always say when you squat down you want to keep your spine and your head and everything the same neutral mm -hmm. so you don't want to be don't arch into the squat just keep your spine neutral and squeeze your abs tight and just stay tight you know what I'm saying? you want to keep your chest not necessarily jacked up but just everything in the motion of where where it should be your body's straight Mm -hmm. The same. If you're squatting down, and your chest is, is your chest is up, not when I say chest up, I don't mean like chest up like arching. It's, right. That's what people get the wrong, you know, the wrong idea. Yeah. If you can keep everything straight and neutral, it makes it perfect. And you can use your up, you can use your back, your lower back, your hips, and everything. Yeah. Versus versus you know just trying to just use legs. Right. You know you can use everything: your legs, hips, back. To me, the best. The strongest, I mean, the strongest squat was using your whole body. Yeah. And I think, I think that was the reason why I was the first to squat 1,100 pounds, because I used my whole body. Yeah. I, was like, I, mean, I held the world record at 1032 for like that. I think it was for that exact reason. And I think, I think that's something that just takes so much time to figure out. And, you know, you can, you know, I've worked with people, the Jerry's work with people that, you know, if you give them some cues and you say, hey, do this, this, and this, it may be years before it really clicks and, and they start to figure it out, including myself. I had a light bulb moment yesterday when I was bench pressing. I used my, tri I used my triceps for the first time yesterday bench pressing. Congrats. But it may, uh, it may take a long time before somebody really figures that out, and that's just, it, you know, it just comes with time and practice and being patient. So, don't, mind, don't mind me driving off. I think my battery is going low. So no, we we actually <laughs> we we're going to wrap it up. We got one more question for you. So if you uh, could give good. one piece of advice to like all lifters, what would it be? One piece of advice for all lifters. One piece of advice. Good advice. Be patient with your with the process. Don't. Don't rush the process. Be patient with it. Don't don't rush the process because I mean you got it's just you got so much time. Don't look at look at going to one competition or one meet as if it's the end of the world, like it's the last one. Think of oh just the first one. I'm just trying to get trying to get started. I want to get better. So be patient in the process throughout throughout each and every workout, and just just be patient. That's what I always try to teach. Just be patient. Be patient when you're learning and you're going through the pro. You know what I'm saying? Not try to rush it. Not try to always want to be like, you know what? I, I, I worked hard. I think I want to try every single day. I want to try, you know, <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, stick with the program. You know, do what you, you know, go to course, the full course. Just mm -hmm. be patient. Yep. Awesome. Yep. I respect yeah, it. Definitely. definitely. And real quick before we cut you off, where can people find you? Oh, they can catch me at uh, Goggins Force. At gmail.com, they got Goggins Sports Instagram. Uh, they can have either one, either one of those. It, it, it does Steve Goggins on my Instagram, on Facebook, Steve Goggins. Any of that. Anybody need any help? Just give me a holler. Love Always it. Welcome. Sounds good, Steve. I re really appreciate your time yeah, here Steve. today, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on and uh, and talk to us. It's been a pleasure. Man, I love it. Tell uh, Todd and Kate I said hello. I will do. Yep. Right, take you care. Take care. Great meeting you guys. Yeah, you too. Yeah, nice meeting you. All right, guys. Yeah, man. That, that was, was awesome. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, hearing Steve talk about, you know, some old stories, um, what's worked for him. And clearly, he was a dude who just figured it out along yeah, the way. Yeah, he did. You know, the, no magic uh, Instagram pages or YouTube channels or books or anything Doesn't like that. Doesn't have to do what everybody on social media is doing. Yeah, yeah. You know? And obviously, you know, he was a little different in his approach. And um, I respect it, and, and I think that that's something that a lot of people could benefit from. So yeah. that was cool having him take the time to talk to us. A lot of good gems in there. Yeah. So, guys, uh, we're going to wrap it up. It was, it was good being back. 
Um, if you guys got any questions or uh, any topics that you want us to discuss, or send you us better video. let us know. That's right. Send us videos <laughs> if you want. Again, accountability. If you need that, hit us up. Stay warm out there. <laughs>